Good evening. And I want to say, wow, we almost have a full auditorium even with this weather. I have to tell you, I was on the elevator today with a couple from Ohio, and they weren't nearly as impressed or worried about the weather today as we are here in Austin, Texas. But I tried to explain to them that everything shuts down and we get a little ice here. So thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome to the first of the Friends events uh, for 2014. I'm Amy Barbie, and I'm the executive director of the LBJ Foundation. And I want to tell you we have a really exciting 2014 coming up because we get to celebrate the 50th anniversary of LBJ's administration and the amazing landmark laws that he signed that really transformed our nation. I don't think there's anyone out there that hasn't at some level been impacted by public funding for education, Medicare, Medicaid, environmental protection, uh, environmental beautification, the arts, humanities, PBS, and of course, civil rights. LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, voting rights, fair housing, and he really believed in equality and opportunity for all. And so in 2014, the library is planning an outstanding Civil Rights Summit on April 8th, 9th, and 10th. And I want to tell you, Mark Uftergrove and his staff have put together an outstanding lineup. You will hear more about that in the months to come. LBJ was willing to give up the political South. He was willing to reach across the aisle to get things done. And I don't think there's a more appropriate program to have tonight as we start 2014, um, because we have the ultimate bipartisan couple. They definitely crossed the aisle. And I think you know who I'm talking about, Mary Maitland and James Carville. Um, politics do make strange bedfellows. And I want to tell you tonight, we will be talking about their new book, Love and War, 20 Years, Three Presidents, Two Daughters, and One Louisiana Home. So not only will we be talking about politics, but we'll be talking about raising two daughters, moving to New Orleans after Katrina, and then also, which I'm, I know we're all curious about, how people with two very different political positions can stay married. Um, I want to tell you, Mary Maitland is a native of Chicago, is a Republican strategist, and first captured national attention as deputy campaign manager for George H.W. Bush in 1992. Later, she served as an assistant for George W. Bush and advised Vice President Dick Cheney. You can now hear her on a nationally syndicated radio show, Both Sides Now. James Carville, a native son of Louisiana, was the campaign manager for Bill Clinton's successful run for the presidency in 1992. And I do, you know, we do, both of them were working in opposite camps in 1992. Since then, he has worked as a political consultant, commentator, and political pundit. Currently, he teaches political science at Tulane University. And our leading tonight's conversation is the director of the LBJ Library. And I want you to join me in welcoming Mary Maitland, James Carville, and Mark Updegrove. Thank you. Hello. God, I mean, so, huh? by all means, make yourself comfortable. There you go. By all means, huh? <laughs> Thank uh, you for coming out in this weather. Uh, this is not typical Austin weather, as you can appreciate. <laughs> and you've spent enough time. I've spent time in Austin. I absolutely, I love this place. It's really great, 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 great place. But it looks like the Keep Austin Weird campaign might be losing a little bit here. Yes. <laughs> We're going Main Street? <laughs> yeah, I went, I went on a drag and looked for dirties and, you know. <laughs> we'll do what we can to, to, to restore the reputation tonight. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the subtitle of your book uh, is 20 Years, Three Presidents, Two Daughters, and One Louisiana Home. So let's start with 20 years. Uh, your relationship almost uh, started like a, a Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy movie. Uh, you were sort of the odd couple from the very beginning. Talk about how your relationship started. It was more like Amy Fisher and Joy Buttafuoco of American <laughs> politics. Uh, this is the, the truth. 
I had a boyfriend, he had a girlfriend, he had many girlfriends, so I don't want to hear about any of the Texas <laughs> campaigns. I'm a don't ask, don't tell kind of girl about his, his history. But my boss, I was chief of staff of the Republican National Committee, and my boss made me read every ancient strategist, every military strategist from Sun Tzu, Attila the Hun, and the main thing was know your enemy. So this guy that nobody knew was winning all these blue blue races in red states, and there's a pencil drawing of him in the Wall Street Journal. And I, I asked a mutual friend if we, could, if we could meet, like for lunch, like professionally. It was a pro professional exchange. The next thing you know, hey, Shilga, come on over to my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you lech? It was love at first lech. It was like... You know, it's odd, there's an Austin origin to our relationship. She called a, a woman named Colette Rooney, who worked for, then worked for, for Tim Russ at Meet the Press, and says, do you know this guy, James Carville? And he says, actually, I know him really well. He gave me my first job in politics, which was the Lloyd Doggett campaign in 1984. <laughs> so you could say the whole thing kind of got started in Austin if you will. Uh, you know, we were talking backstage. I, I am a, it, I'm a statistical freak. I got married at 49 and have only been married once. There have been people that got married at 49 but generally not for the first time since the 20, so, so that was kind of odd. Uh, and uh, we have been, we started dating, I will never forget, January the 8th, 1991. So, uh, what? What do you remember? I said so romantic. I love that you remember that. Well, it's kind of hard to forget after you've been that single as long as I have. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a life-changing event, if you will. Okay, stop while you're ahead. Mm -hmm. So you were working for opposing campaigns in the 1992 presidential election. Uh, Mary, you were working for uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, who was vying for re-election. James, you were working for Bill Clinton. Uh, so did you ever feel like your getting involved would be looked upon as a treasonous act by your bosses or your, your colleagues? I did not. It was in some quarters, but those were not people I would consider worthy of caring what their opinions were. I never had any issues with the Bushes or the Cheneys or any of my colleagues that I we, there's honor among thieves here. There's, and if anybody was gonna get any secret information out of anybody, it was gonna be me getting it out of him. But <laughs> the truth is he moved to Little Rock. No one believes mm -hmm. this, but we didn't see each other for that whole year. And, and I, quit, I got so mad at him because he, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a time where I, the Clinton campaign was calling for me to be fired and he got on TV and he goes, you can love the sinner and hate the sin. So I quit talking <laughs> to him. <laughs> And so one of my reporter friends calls and she goes, you've got to return his calls. I hate when grown men cry. He keeps calling me crying to return his calls. So it was kind of a hard romantic thing to do. You know, if, if you think about it, it is a kind of part of democratic culture that you can't discriminate about some, against someone because of what their spouse does. I mean, and literally, if you are, if if you're, if somebody, if it particularly like a woman's going to work for a law firm, so well, I don't trust because her husband works for other firm. What does what, what, what does what my husband ha do have to do with what I do? And so it, it was. You wouldn't. Maybe some people felt it, but it wouldn't be cool to bring it up, right? Because somebody would say, "No, he's got his professional life. His wife has her professional life, and that's really not any of our business." Would be the way to. Yeah. I think the way, that, the correct way to look at it. But did, did, did the overall reaction to your relationship in any way surprise you? Well, the focus, I mean, we were just doing our jobs. I didn't think it was that big of a star-crossed, lovered kind of thing. But there, it became like this Romeo and Juliet thing. Yes, the attention to it. But think about this. You, nobody but another political operative could understand the emotion that goes into working on a campaign. So uh, what, what would be boring to me or an impossible relationship to me would be 
some guy who says, oh, I hate politics, or politics is boring, or whatever. But one thing he is not is boring. And the, but the attention mostly derived from when we were losing, this is what happens in politics, y'all in polit politics. Nobody wants to go out and defend Poppy, who was, uh, I adore, I adore how cute was he at that Duke game. I just adore this man. So I, I'm not a TV person. As you can see, I have a face for radio, as they say, but I was the one that went out to defend him. And he, then, and he was always on TV. And the, it just, that, I guess that's what exacerbated it. But the, I want to tell you a love story about James. And I think at the end of the campaign, I hated him so much. Just because you love somebody doesn't mean you don't, can't hate him. So we were on opposing Sunday shows. And I go right back to Air Force, Andrews Air Force Base. <laughs> And the mill aide says, I don't think I put this in the book, President, uh, President Bush wishes to speak to you right away about uh, James Carville. I'm like, oh, no, what did he do? <laughs> so, I, so I go into the cabin, and he goes, you know what? You know what your James, your precious James just said? And I'm like, I can't even imagine. I don't want to. <laughs> the Ch Bob Schieffer says, say one good thing about, is there one good thing you can say about uh, your opponent? He goes, Anybody that Mary Madeline loves as much as she loves George Herbert Walker Bush must be a great guy. And he was so, Poppy Bush was so moved. <laughs> oh, I love you, I hate you. Oh, I love you, I hate you. <laughs> you know, she was one of the great TCU fans ever. You know, that guy bleeds purple. Uh, <laughs> to kind of, if you think about it, the smartest thing said when we got married in the press it was a, a Walter Shapiro. I think he's in time. He said, it's not surprising that they married each other. It would have been surprising if one of them would have married a tree surgeon from Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything against tree surgeon from Idaho, but that people in politics know, right. you know each other. I mean, you, you, if you think about it, 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 it the, the, you, you meet people in, in, in people in politics run into each other. And it's kind of hard to fall in love if you don't run into somebody. <laughs> You know, and so if, if you think about it, you're more likely to, it's more likely you have an English professor from UT marries an English professor from A&M right. than it would be that they'd marry a, you know, but have an accountant from Lubbock. Right, in the same circle. In the we, same circle, the same, they go to the same conferences. Are, let's they, just admit it, we are a little offbeat, even in our own profession, we're a little offbeat. What I did think, what did bother me in the duration of of, the, of his existence is thinking that we had a stunt marriage, because it's I we, I had those girls at 42 and 45. That is not a stunt. That is no <laughs> stunt. There's a reason people don't have babies in their 40s. It's a stunt, but something you're not going to want to try at home. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go again, and James you... said no. I had to stop for my second birth birthing in labor to give him an epidural. He was just so. <laughs> So you're a little high strung about the whole thing. This is not a stunt marriage. Uh, well, yeah. You, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no I'm, uh, in the book, Mary, you enumerate the things, the 10 things you most often fight about. And remarkably, only one of them is political, and, and that was the Iraq War. Why did that create such dissension in your marriage? Mm, well. It was, because it was difficult in the sense that we were trying, and you can see how the Obama administration is still trying, it's a difficult problem. And it was a, a horrible place to be. I wasn't, didn't intend to stay in the White House. I was a, a Poppy Bush guy, came in to integrate the OVP, the Office of the Vice President in the White House, and then 9-11 happened, and I spent two years in an undisclosed secure location. And I had access to a lot of information that he didn't have. And it just got political. And so we were kind of having a proxy war. It wasn't like, you know, he was sticking up for his side. And I, I was working it through. Where was the strategy? I was working through. So it's difficult. But here's another reason I love him. And this works in marriages. Some things you're not going to fix. I mean, at one time, I'm screaming and yelling, and I always got to have the last word. 
And he rolled down the window, we were doing some weird, he goes, I'm not gonna fight with you about Iraq anymore. It takes two people to fight, you can keep fighting. I, I can't hear you, I'm not listening. We, that's yeah. why I moved from number one to number six. Yeah, I, uh, I thought, I think, and highly likely that I'll continue to think it was a really dumb thing we did. And sometimes, if you gotta have a fight in a marriage, at least it wasn't over the toothpaste cap, it was over a wall. We can fight over uh, that too. But, I, you know, at, at, at some point, everything, you, you move out. Uh, then, you know, we had to stop fighting. It just wasn't, it wasn't gonna change anything. And I wasn't gonna change her mind, and she wasn't gonna change my mind, and it wasn't gonna change what happened, and then I just try not to think about it. <laughs> Yeah, we're, and we're gen I know this sounds disingenuous, but we're kind of happy, fun people. We don't like to fight. I don't like to fight. I don't like to fight with my kids. I don't like to fight with my husband. I don't like to fight with people. It's, it's, I don't even like doing TV anymore, because unless it's like George Snuffleupolis or our beloved Tim Russett, or somebody who's civil, you know. Well, we knew George before, you know, and we all had little kids together, but it just, we just don't like to fight. Yeah. No, I don't think most people don't like, I mean, I don't know if married people, most people don't, I mean, maybe there are some, but most people would rather not fight. Of course it's he not, does it's not have, the most pleasant he has his own sports room mm -hmm. with, on, in which Fox News can yeah. never be on. He has his own bathroom, his own closet, none of my pets can come in his room, <laughs> in, in any of his right. areas. That's a recipe so, for yeah, happy I, I tell you, my advice, was, what was your, my advice is kick the can down the road. Don't confront shit. Don't tell people what you really think at a given time because you're going to be stuck with that statement. And it's better just to go silent and go your own way and it, it'll get a work itself out. <laughs> you know? This is really good advice. If somebody says, you know, tell me what you really think, no, you really don't want to know what I really think. It's not good. It's not healthy. And because the problem is, <laughs> and in a marriage, what you think right now may not be what you think two months from now, but what you said you think right now is going to be thrown in your face two months from now. But I don't, so in the his best case, thing to do there's just, only three things. Honey, what are you thinking about? Football, food, or sex, okay? <laughs> when you ask a man, are you, when you, are you, what are you thinking about? He says, nothing. They mean it. I'm chilling out. Not, <laughs> unless it's football, food, yeah. or sex. Every, like, every now and then I think of football or food, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, the other political issue that seemed to cause a riff in your marriage was the 2000 well, Why do you keep dragging up stuff that caused well, a riff in our marriage? <laughs> Well, you, 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 you talk about it in the book. <laughs> I'm just teasing. But it was the, uh, yeah. which by the way, is a wonderful read. Uh, it is a, 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 a very en engrossing read. I got through it in two days, so I wholeheartedly recommend it. But you do talk about the 2000 election and the Florida recount and how that created uh, great tension in your marriage. Talk about that period of your lives. Okay. I don't know segue off of, the book is not really political. The, I didn't want to put any politics in it except for the positive politics of the restoration and recovery of Katrina, and we never come to Texas not, without thanking Texans for all, all of your help. But the publisher insisted that we put some politics in because we've been through, through some things in the last uh, 20 years. But it, what the recount was emotional enough for everybody else, but what what happened was we were already at this pinnacle of emotion and tension, and then within five minutes of the result, I got a call from the Cheneys, and I went into the administration, left him with a two-year-old and a five-year-old. He was not happy. He did not talk to me for a long time, and I can't say that I blamed him, but he turned out to be a pretty good Mr. Mom while I was in an undisclosed cave somewhere for, for two years. Yeah, I probably wasn't the only Democrat that felt pretty bent out of shape about the 2000. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty common reaction. <laughs> the, the, you talked about New Orleans, and, and really this is, uh, in so many ways, this book is a love letter to New Orleans, uh, where you moved in 2008, and, and James, it was a homecoming for you. You're a Louisiana boy, but M Mary, you're a Chicagoan. Uh, what drew you to the Crescent City? 
New Orleans is, I loved New Orleans long before I knew who James Carville was. I, we got married in New Orleans, I wanted to be in New Orleans, I love visiting New Orleans, it's very much like Chicago, it's ethnic, it's got neighborhoods, it's got music, it's got architecture, it's got all the things I love, plus good weather, and, and it's got something that the Midwest doesn't have, sugar. We're going to become a sliver on a rail. <laughs> Anybody from the Midwest who sits, anything that says, follows sugar, <laughs> I'm following it. So when he said, let's go, it, you know, it, it, we were looking back, it was a slightly irresponsible given the state of, uh, of New Orleans when the kids were as young as they were and to uproot them. The way we did, but it worked out good, and that's what that's what the book's about. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, we, we got married in New Orleans, and that was at Mary's insistence. She always had a, a, a real affection for it. And uh, I, the thing about the the, the events of the, what I call the Great Engineering Failure 2005, which is more commonly referred to as Katrina. After that event, I'd always, I grew up, my grandparents, were, my grandmother was from New Orleans, they got married there a couple occasions, I lived there, but basically I had used, abused, enjoyed, took for granted the culture. I would go down, I would get drunk, I would eat, I would go to Mardi Gras, I, I would, you know, go to we French Quarter, I would do the whole deal. And after 2005, I, I, it dawned on me that the preservation of that culture was not a given, mm -hmm. that it was very, very fragile. And what sort of set me off is when I read that a thousand trumpets had been lost in the storm. And, and this is not something that you can pass, if you skip a generation, it's dead. It's not, you can't go to the conservatory and learn it, it's done. And I had watched my mother who spoke French before English I'd watch us lose a huge chunk of our French language culture in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so that really like depressed me to no end. And the city itself, if you think about it, is not, it's, economically it's kind of important, all right? But culturally, it's the most identifiable place in the United States. I mean, you, know, you know what the food tastes like, you know what the music sounds like, you know what a carnival look, crew looks like, you know what a New Orleans funeral is, you know what the architecture is, you know everything about it. It's a completely identifiable culture. And uh, I, I, I felt like the whole thing could kind of go, and it's kind of, I, I talk about it in the book, and uh, in my kids, and I was like, scream at them about the coach and how we had to preserve this and promote it and foster it. And one of my daughters, their daughter came in and they said, Dad, would you take me to Pinkberry? I said, Pinkberry, what the hell is that? She said, it's a new yogurt place. I said, God damn it, we don't eat yogurt in this family. We have snowball. <laughs> We're not going to get any yogurt. <laughs> it's a, I became almost like a... a He's a food ayatollah. A, a cultural, yeah, ayatollah. And I, I like they played, we had some parade and it was something other than New Orleans music. I mean, I, I, you know, I was supporting our mayor who's up for re-election next Saturday and I think, think it's gonna be fine. And I, my only request of it would never have anything at any city event that's not New Orleans food or New Orleans music. You know, <laughs> I don't wanna hear any, you know, Nashville sound or Motown, any of that, nothing, no. Do you know uh, how y'all think, like keep Austin weird? <laughs> New Orleans is really weird. It's like the last bastion of weirdness. Donna Brazil was over for dinner last night. Rahm Emanuel's the mayor of Chicago now, was in town and we had a quiet dinner. It's hard for the old, us old timers to all get together. And Donna and I started talking about how bored and cold we were in the debates in New Hampshire. So we hopped on a plane to, to when L, LSU was in which game were they in? Well, I don't want to think about it when it got creamed by Alabama and All right, <laughs> well, <laughs> we just got on a plane. I so we pull up to my house. Little I had he doesn't know we're coming. I have no idea he's having this party at this house. He had the entire LSU band, the whole Tigers band, 
in front of our house. Like, let's go Tigers, let's go. So Donna stays out all night, goes to the game, which apparently didn't go well. I didn't, then we went back to New Hampshire. It's just a place that brings out, it's like an adventurous, kind of fun place. I'm sorry, honey. Are you no, 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 no. You bring up the 2000 recount then the LSU National Championship <laughs> bring it down. What the hell, man, huh? We're just up here scratching the scabs. Is what we're doing. Let's talk about Did Seattle. I tell you about the time uh, A&M beat you. No. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it is. And, and to watch it sort of come back the way it has and, and, and to watch how strong the culture has become. You know, it was, I'll give you a good example. It's the, the, the day of the engineering failure, there were 809 restaurants. There's actually a guy that monitors this. And today, they're like 1,360. The, the, the Quint Davis, who runs Jazz Fest, tells me that the street music is now as good as it's ever been. And that's the way these musicians come up. And if you, it, 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 we were a chairman of the, 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 I love this story, but this kind of, we were the chairman of the Super Bowl last year. And we have, not to the extent you have in Austin, but we have a, a, a small, growing, and increasingly significant kind of tech community. And one of the things that, one of the apps that they developed that I love is, if you stop and you think about how, what is the one thing that I carry around that my, my daughters don't? Cash. Cash. <laughs> young, people, uh, young people do not carry cash. They go on the Starbucks, parts and so kids. they <laughs> developed a cell phone app that you could tip with your cell phone. Because that's how the band lives. If you're a street band, mm. you live on tips. Mm -hmm. So you, you might have 15, 23-year-olds, or you know, some, some kids from the University of Texas going to the weekend. They're not carrying cash, so they, 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 they don't tip. So they, they, they developed an app where they put there and you could tip with your cell phone. That's how you. That's how you preserve a culture. If these, if these, if these young musicians don't get this, they don't live off of that. Then it, it, it sort of goes, and, and you, 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 the, you stop and you think about that. And uh, you know, you have Sixth Street here, which was Sixth Street was here in 1982. It said people were still still telling me about it. that. That's part of what Austin is. Mm -hmm. Hey, you may not be a player. Ah, you know, you're not going to go down Saturday night. You can't go out of walking plays or drunk kids, whatever the hell it is. But it's important that it's there. <laughs> it's very important that it's there. But you worked, you, you came to national prominence by working for the Comeback Kid, and now you live in the Comeback City. What is it the root of its revival and resilience as a, as a city? Because it's a remarkable story, the Comeback of New Orleans. You know, I, I've, I've thought about this long and hard. There the, are the two things. I think there was a moment where a people from the city and that knew it or were from there or the whole diaspora, whatever you want to call it, just said, you know, we're just not going to let it go under. There was just, and, 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 and I, I, I'll, I'll say this. I'll give President Bush 43 credit. They, they, after, I'm not going to talk about before, during, or mm. immediately after the storm, but in the aftermath, and I'll give uh, Don Powell, another Texan, a lot of credit. And they put a lot of, a lot of skin in the reconstruction. And that was a very, that was a very kind of important, but what really happened was People, and I think Mary and I, an example of it, just said, you know what, we're just not letting it go. It's just too important. It's just too important. And, and, I, and there was a time when you talk to people will tell you it was about, they didn't know if it was going to make it. And I, I can't give enough credit to, uh, to our mayor. I really can't. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, did, you know, when you're in a place like that, where it's sort of fragile and, and you have a, but leadership just matters. When you're up against a wall, it really, really matters. And mm -hmm. in a way that it, it, it doesn't matter as much in a state level or, you know, if the Dallas is going to do well. If you have a kind of okay mayor Dallas, they'll be fine. 
we're, we're not like that. When, you, when, you're not, when you're up against a wall, you, you have to have really good leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and, and anybody, you know, if you, you don't think that leadership matters, look at the difference between Chicago and Detroit. Look at the difference between Colombia and Venezuela. I mean, I do a lot of work internationally, and some places are just kind of naturally prosperous and they'll do okay. Some, some, peop some places really, really have to have that kind of leadership, and that, and that was the position that we were in. Uh, so, I, it, it, you know, then people started to, to, to I give the, the school to Teach for America people, and, and, and young people, it was, my brother was telling me he's a contract in Baton Rouge, and he, this never happened. All the young people in Baton Rouge now want to be in New Orleans. Hmm. That was never the kind of case before, but, and, and, I, and I think that part of it is, Tulane became, the year, the year in 2005, they had 17,000 applicants. In 2012, they had 46,000 applicants. For 1,500 spots. But it didn't become that much of a better school, but young people, are, they want to go somewhere where there's a challenge. That, uh, that drew young people there. And the, other, the, the, the best description I ever heard is, is a, a guy, it's a, it's a it's a city that's comfortable with its otherness. We really don't aspire. It, it, you live in Austin, you talk about what a great quality of life you have. You have the hill country, you got Town Lake, you got the university, you have, I mean, it's really kind of, yeah, really remarkable sort of quality of life in a, in, in, in a city like this. And, and you have great parks, you got civic endeavors, everything. We, never ever talk about quality of life. We talk about way of life. We have our own food, our own music, our own social structure, our own funerals, our own architecture, or whatever. So to live our life in our culture is really what our, and some people say, oh, you live there, it's got there bugs and storms and humidity and poverty and you know, yeah, we got all that. But shit, we like our red beans on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I, I th this really is, you can skip over the national political parts of the book, which we were forced to put into, but the, the, I said I'd never do another book with him. I haven't read his half of the book we wrote 20 years ago. I said it was like giving birth without an epidural. But I, people increasingly, and with urgency, kept saying, how do you guys do it? They think there's some magic fairy dust, because we stayed married, mm. that, that can be applied to, Politics. So this is a happy story about politics because Mitch didn't really want to run. James did a poll and showed him how he could win and run and win. And then it was, and we got 67% of the black folks, 67% of the white folks, a very happy, like, uh, across town. And when he got into City Hall, it, there was no, there were no computers. The debt was, way beyond what he thought it was. No computers, no hot water. His wife had to come and clean the bathrooms. And people quit their big, giant jobs at law firms and came to serve in city government for pennies mm -hmm. and worked, you know, 24-7, 365. And, it became, and you can do business there now, reliably do business. And he just, it was such a sacrifice for him and his family, he has five little we're all bigger now, and he's running again his election. But it, ju it just, it's time for people to see that, uh, pol that, that politics is not as dishonorable, disreputable mm. as it looks, as it's being, currently being conveyed. I, I brought up Ron for the same reason. Running Chicago is not easy. He didn't need to do that. The same, I love mayors, the mayor of Philly, the new mayor of Detroit. I mean, there's, if you, but it takes the, the, that kind of leadership and citizens who want to work together and real transparency and accountability, and it can be done. So you both mentioned Detroit. What can a city like Detroit learn from New Orleans in reviving itself? What's the, what, what are the principal things that it can take from from that example? This is, 
silver lining thing to say and a terrible thing to say, but you almost, it's kind of an alcoholic thing. You had to be at rock bottom. I mean, and they are. So they just can't, you can't fool around the stuff that Rom has to fool around with in Chicago and such. Um, but we've learned what our mayor says is, yeah, I don't care if you're right or you're left, he happens to be a Democrat. I led the Republicans for him, all four of them in the city, but you know. <laughs> he said, because if you, if you come in here and you want to divide or you want to make a hassle, get out. If you come in here with a solution, let's hear you. And his doors are open, and I think that's what they're trying to do to try. No, J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, have made it, kind of, they made it sort of their personal project, that, and that really matters too. If people feel like they can do business, and they can be mentored, and they can be supported, and there's a clean government, a business-friendly government, and that's a great American city, and it's, I'm excited about working on this project. I, I, I think it'll draw young people back, too. Well, yeah. set, we, I didn't tell you this. I'm working on this project. On this project, yeah. Um, I don't, there are, well, it, there was similar in a way that there were both cities that were in trouble. Mm -hmm. And we got hit by like a, what I call, engineering failure that, that our levees were supposed to hold it whole. And then Detroit got hit that they were already in trouble when they got hit with the recession in the auto industry. Right. It would really, whatever they were, really. Uh, you know, it, it, think about it, it's like two different circumstances. Uh, but, you know, we've had a somewhat of a revival in the auto industry, and they'll probably have to diversify, build around there, and, you know, the way that you know, the way that it works is, is people starting to now come in, buy a property, uh, and, and hopefully, uh, like we did, they'll, they'll be able to entice a kind of creative class back into the city. Mm -hmm. uh, then they'll have to reconfigure some things, and it, it, you know, it's a kind of block by block, thing, thing by thing. And it may not come back and be the same place that it was before, but that's okay, too. Uh, and, and, you know, it's always going to be the, the need, you know, it's, it's still the headquarters of, of Ford. It's still in De Dearborn, Detroit. You know, General right. Motors is still there. Uh, and, and, and they, they'll be able, to, they'll, they'll figure something out. Yeah. But it's better, better not to have this happen to you in the first place. Yeah. yeah I mean, this was, this was a, 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 we're back, uh, you know. But you, you, you learn never to take things for granted. <laughs> the point is. Change is certain, progress is not. Okay, that's something we agree on. And, and, and I, I can't say enough, young people are like magnets. If you, if you want to be optimistic about anything, as James, I'm going to quote my beautiful husband here, there are, this generation is far better than we deserve. Mm -hmm. They are really, they, we're like Silicon South now. Again, James is raised not as much as Austin, but they have invented so many things to solve problems on the spot. And one, I know they can do that in Detroit too. One of the issues about business coming back to Detroit is security. Well, we're working, we don't work anymore, this is all volunteer stuff, with a, with a technical, uh, with Palantir, and they've made this robot that's like a security guard. And it scares the bejesus out of, you know, like, I don't know, it looks, like a little tank thing, but it talks and says stop, halt, it can film you and all that. But I mean, that's like, you can't get security guards to go in there. And it, I mean, it's, little, it's not a little thing, but there's a lot of technical things and, you, and you, these kids come up with solutions that are way outside of the box of thinking. And, and, and they have their Midwestern values and they have a good governor and they have it's just, uh, I'm very feeling very positive about it. You brought two um, members of the next generation to New Orleans with you, your two daughters. How did they adapt to the move from Washington where they had grown up to, uh, to New Orleans? Uh, you know, it was a, 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 we've talked about it, we look back on it, and it was a really almost irresponsible thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and first of all, they were very, like the eighth and the fifth grade, which is, that's a, let me tell you something. 
the most vicious specimen on earth. <laughs> the most vicious specimen on earth is not a great white shark, is not a saltwater crocodile, is not some Al Qaeda guy in Yemen. It is a seventh grade girl. <laughs> And I see a lot of heads nodding out there. <laughs> and so we moved with a fifth and eighth grader. We were right there in the sweet spot, if you will. Uh, and, you know, it's a, I say it's a culture. It's a different culture. And, you know, one of the things that my children had to, there was a, a like a survivor code that if you didn't go through Katrina that, you know, you weren't like, in, in, in New Orleans, for whatever reason, more so now, but it's never been a place that's like totally embraced strangers. Now I was from there, so the, you know, I'd hardly like a stranger, but, but it was, but it was, they love it now, they did great, but it was a, you don't move a fifth and eighth, a five, fifth and eighth grade daughters without some element of risk here, let's just put it that way. <laughs> And uh, that, you know, the one that the, the really, when James had to suffer through this, let's just say they were at one end of the spectrum, his wife was at the other end of the spectrum. He would just say, This is too much gynodynamics for me, and he'd go in his room and shut the door. <laughs> so he says, to, he says to the little one, He goes, when, I, when I'm around you, do I embarrass you? She says, Daddy. I just think about you when I get embarrassed. <laughs> so, you know, they're they're pretty mean too, and these are good, they're really good kids. Find the, the older one went to Sacred Heart, and they have their own culture, yeah. and they said so she had her own womb, if you will. After four years, the other one said, "Mother, you just don't provide the structure I require. I'm going to boarding school." And I said. Do you know how much it costs, how hard it is to get in, that your father is going to melt down? She gives me great answers for everything. She goes, he's always close to meltdown. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> so she, I mean, they, we've taught them to think for themselves. They're both highly opinionated. Gosh, I wonder where they get that. And they are, now that they are not in New Orleans, the big ones in college, it's like an exotic. Place. You know, people think New Orleans is really exotic and they all want to come to Mardi Gras and they all want to come to the French Quarter and they want to see the crazy stuff. That's yeah. now, now they think it's cool. Yeah, but I think it would have been miserable. It, and Look. you could be on Mars on a space station with two teenage girls. And Every daddy in this auditorium has had to go through, I had to go through. Could you just let me off like two blocks away? You don't need to pull up right to the front. <laughs> Maybe people can see you. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't roll down the window. Right. Don't even stop. Let's be like rolling. You know. <laughs> You're about to get married when you have kids. You cannot roll down the window. You can't stop. They, they, you just slow down and then they jump out. <laughs> oh, this is a true story, okay? So she, he would not do that. He would get out of the car every day after we won the Super Bowl. See, there's something. And he'd go, who that? Who that? Who that? Standing in the street. She's trying to ignore him, you know? And it's not like he's quiet. Finally, one day she turns around. She's six feet tall, frighteningly tall. It's like, and the hair down to here, you know? Who that? Who that? Who that always embarrassing me? You that. You that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just a mother. I just can't mother. <laughs> Who that? You, one of the most uh, moving passages in the book for, for me was when you talk about when you first moved to New Orleans in 2008 and you learned that your friend Tim Russert had passed away. Uh, and it was a blow for both of you. You considered him family. Uh, Washington's a tough place, and, and people are either loved or, or hated, or both. He was universally loved. What made him so different? What, why was Tim Russert such a special guy? Someone, we're still very close. Luke, his son is like our son, and our daughters were like, you know, he, we, loved each other. He's a family man from Buffalo. And somebody told me a story last night that he, 
he said the same thing about the book. I had a guy I knew from a long time ago at NBC. He said, I really liked what you said about Tim. And one day, I want to tell you the story. One day, he was out to took us out to dinner in the bureau. Here's the bureau chief. And somebody who's on the air today, who shall remain unnamed because I don't want to embarrass him, was nasty with the waitress and because they were taking time. And, and Tim over-tipped her. And as they're walking, he said, do you never talk to the wait staff like that again? It's, she's working hard. It's not her fault that the chef, that the, cook, the cooks, you know, the kitchen's slow. Don't you talk to people like that? Well, that's Tim. And he didn't embarrass the guy in front of anybody else. All he wanted to do was come and eat. She's from Buffalo. He wanted to come eat meatballs, watch football, and, and he just the real deal. I mean, I don't, and, and he just, a lot of Washington is, it's not mean so much as it's transactional. Mm -hmm. he, he's, there we were, we're still friends. We're still friends with Maureen and Luke, and he's, he was very faithful. Faith filled. He's a mm. great Catholic, and he's he, the only guy for the longest time on TV who, 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 who was so steeped in policy they could go three, four, five questions deep. And right. I mean, it just. And he was fun. I'm gonna start crying. It just, I just miss him. It just, we, it just was unbelievable. Yeah, the day we moved, we we flew down that morning. And uh, so we got there, and I, I had a, to go to anybody that's, that lived in New Orleans knows what I'm talking about. I, I went to, on the way to Langenstein's, which is a kind of legendary small store in uptown New Orleans. I had to get just coffee and eggs and put, 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 put anything in the refrigerator. And the phone rings on an Arabella Street, and it's Al Hunt, and says, I got the worst news you can imagine. I think Tim just died, and then I looked on the phone, put, put in a book, and Barbara Fant, who was this person, I could sort of thing up, and then I knew. We didn't even, we had to fly right back to Washington. And I just said it was almost like, you know, you want to separate. I mean, really, it's June 13th. <laughs> uh, I think he, and we had our baseball tickets together, we had our basketball tickets together. Uh, and I think viewers and people like trusted him because it felt like he was sort of one of them. Mm. You know, he maintained that kind of regular guy, sort of Buffalo, a raw, you know, persona about him at the same token. You know, he was a pretty direct question and, you know, was really good at follow up. I don't know, it was in, in the, at, you know, and he really, dominated that Sunday morning TV for mm -hmm. a long time. And mm -hmm. it, when he took that show over, it wasn't the case. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, because, uh, but he just had a way of connecting with viewers in a way that, that viewers really sort of trusted him. And then he became, and this, and this is when you really, when you become, when something happens, and that's the gold standard that you go on. And if you survive that, then you kind of turn the corner wherever you are. Right. Uh, you know, I don't maybe, to some extent, at some point, you know, Chris Christie may need a Tim Russet. There's no Tim, you know, for, or, or any, any time that you're kind of going through that, he had that, that way about him, if you will. You know, uh, we used to literally call this in politics, you know, in the primary, the invisible primaries, you know, this from being in the media. You're the money primary, the consultant primary, this all before you even get started. And then there was the meet the press primary. If you didn't get through a meet the press, remember yeah. when John Edwards yeah. famously yeah. went on and almost, I love John Edwards. You want honesty? I can fake it. <laughs> <laughs> you want authenticity? But you had, and Dick Cheney loved going on there because that was not child's play. That was yeah. not spin, that was not talking points. And Think about that. Just like do thought exercise. Is there? I like. We like George. We like George a lot. George. He's, a, he's George very George. smart, smart, smart. I think he's going to become the primary. You have to get through this gauntlet mm -hmm. to because you yeah, got to stand. Yeah, and it's too. good to have. You don't want to have these soft bullying because you want to be. Yeah, George is one of my best friends in the world. And he's got. He's really. Like, God, look what he's. I mean, George is accomplishing something in television. It's really remarkable because yeah. he's got the number one rated morning show and now he's got, you know, 
the number one rated, a, almost number one, soon to be the number one rated Sunday morning show. So he's seen six days a week. And that's, that's not easy to do, to, to do that much yeah, television. That's, that's not, and Joyce career With been, two girls, preteen. I said, you know, wait. Really remarkable. This last weekend we were on, he had uh, gotten an interview with Putin, so he flew to Putin, came back, and he had those two little girls. I'm like, your life cannot go, you're, you got about maybe 18 more months. <laughs> then you're going to be this. Who dat? Who dat? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's uh, but we've been, far, you know, obviously we've been very, very fortunate to, you know, be around some of the most interesting things and interesting people. And, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, a, a girl from the south side of Chicago, a guy from a one-stop sign place in South Louisiana, we used to say we were so far in the stick they had to pipe sunshine in. <laughs> But, uh, and that's what we want to do in a book. In 20 years, we had participated, have been a lot of big events in, in um, you know, America, the whole Clinton impeachment thing, the recount of 9-11, the Katrina reconstruction. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've been, I don't know if Washington's word, but we've had a chance to see a lot and participate a lot in, in, in our Not time. Not that right? I want to prove his point about I remember everything, but during the Clinton recent unpleasantness, I did not get involved. I just had my second baby. I, didn't, I don't judge other marriages because I didn't like mine being judged, and I figured his punishment for whatever he did was to be having to live with Hillary. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> So, but I said to James at the time, I said, you've gone out there and you've, you kept repeating this lie over and over and over. He lied to you, you were lied to, and then you went out there and repeated, how, how can you, I can't deal with, that's what I can't deal with. And, and I'm postpartum, and I'm depressed, a new infant, she was cow, he goes, sugar, if I did something that stupid with a girl that young, I'd lie about it too. <laughs> Not the right thing to say. Yeah, I, I, I told her, I said, they could have had me against the wall with the blindfold and the cigarette, and I said, I never touched her, I swear I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Also, how can you get, how can you fight when somebody <laughs> says something like them? Like, okay. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little bit about presidential politics as we look forward to 2016. James, uh, I had a dinner with you in, in, in 2008, and uh, it was during the Democratic primaries, and there was a pretty crowded field. And you said, I guarantee there's, if this is a two-person race, it's either Obama or Mama. <laughs> so now uh, Obama's going to leave the Oval Office in 2017. Is Mama the inevitable Democratic nominee? I, I, this is the way I would put it. I would not be surprised if she ran, but on the other hand, I wouldn't be shocked if she didn't run. I guess that's the way of saying I think she probably will, but, you know, who knows. And she would be... Uh, a, for the nomination, she would be a pretty formidable front runner. The, 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 the Democrats are really not, we're not looking for kind of a fight. Mm -hmm. i tell you, I, I'll make a prediction. And I wanna, uh, I, I, Rick Perry is going to run and he's going to do better than people think. <laughs> okay, I, 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 that, I, you, you when a, a what I, I have said it before, and I'll say it very clearly right here. I said, I, I said publicly, running for president is like having sex. No one did it once and forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> it has a very high recidivism rate. <laughs> All right. What did and, I tell you? And sex, once football, you go, I've just said, and once you go around the track once, you learn a lot. And I. I whether you vote for him, I'm not for him, I vote for anything, but my prediction is he runs and he is going to be a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, can, you, you can see it kind of unfolding. People, are, the, the thing is starting to just wind down a little bit right now. Uh, and I think they, the Republican nominating, assuming that, that that Mrs. Clinton runs, it's certainly conventional wisdom, and I think it's true, but we're going to be much more interesting on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. 
which can be a good thing, actually, because you kind of want that the long, drawn-out thing between Senator Obama and Senator Clinton was is that it actually, they, they were both remain popular the whole time. Mm -hmm. It didn't hurt. And, and what the Republicans need is for somebody to, to beat somebody. They need someone to look strong. And for whatever reason, Perry didn't run very well in uh, 2012, but, but I, 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 my guess is, is he'll run and he'll run a lot, he'll be a lot more effective. And, and it, 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 it's, you know, yeah, yeah, if you Bill Clinton, you can do it one time, the first time, but there ain't a lot of Bill Clintons out there. So you remember the, Reagan had to go around the track once. 76 and then yes, he came yeah. back in 80. Yeah, and he so, was a much better candidate. Who, who's the most formidable Republican opposition? You know, the, the one that beats other formidable candidates. <laughs> now, now, hmm. That's not a cop-out. That's not a cop-out. Because if, if, if Romney never got a chance to look formidable because he never really beat anybody. So if you have a, a, a Rand Paul, a Scott Walker, a, a Rick Perry, uh, uh, Ted Cruz, I don't know, but, but you know what? He's, you may not like him, but he's good on his feet. He doesn't, he look, mm -hmm. he's in a debate, he's not Michelle Bachman. <laughs> All right, I'm just saying, in love with you want to, if you, <laughs> he, he, other people that sort of run, if I were a Republican, which I'm decidedly not, <laughs> what I would want would be a big, strong field. Remember the 1980 Republican field? Mm -hmm. Bill Reagan, John Conley, George Bush, George Bush, Bob Dole, mm -hmm. uh, Howard Baker. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you when you beat uh, John Anderson, I mean, when you beat somebody, you understand you you look good. If you win, you know, if, if, if it's, it's a, you know, if you win a little conference. If you win Conference USA, you don't look as good as if you win the SEC. You look a lot better. Why? Because you really had to get to, to go. And it's, a, it's the same thing in presidential politics. And when you saw people start, other Republicans start seeing somebody, you know, stand up, winning a primary, and, and they look strong, and, and that, that matters. That matters. And that's, that, that's what they need. A, 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 no, there are not many fields that you're going to get like a 1980 Republican mm -hmm. field, one of the strongest feels ever feel about a major party. But to stop and, 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 and sort of think about it, that's the kind of way to think about this. So who am I? If anybody came through and emerged that and unified that party, they would be a very strong general election candidate. Yeah. But that's what they, and so when my Republican friend says, what do you, what do you think? It's, you, you, and give everybody a check. You want them all to run. It's better for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Mary, what, is, what does the GOP need to do to get on track to win? In 2016. Well, part of the, uh, a big part of why the brand is so disfavored or, or disfavorables are so high is because Republicans don't like Republicans. I'm a constitutionalist. I'm a federalist. That's what I keep working on all these years. And I forget the last race I got involved in it just because it, it was Fred Thompson, who James says is the only candidate who was ever tested positive for Ambien, okay? <laughs> I said, I, he's a federalist. He goes, no one even knows that a federalist is. So, but this has been, I'm sort of a pre-Socratic kind of virtuous state person. I like governors. I want a strong field. I want a proven record. Uh, you can't just, and I'm not, I don't mean to cast dispersions on any of the previous field, but that was just like a circus for the, TV, debate things. So the party has taken, a, we're gonna have a limited number of debates in, in a way that isn't like, the price is right, you know, like a TV show kind of thing. And what they need to do is, to, is propose just not break this. It's not right that they don't, they're an obstructionist party. They have a set of, we have a set of beliefs, we have a set of proposals, they need to be articulate about them. You, I get it, I'm in Austin, you can hiss and boo, but I'm gonna tell you this about Ted Cruz. He, I, I, I saw him, I was doing something for somebody, and I said, if you're ever in New Orleans, you can come to the house and have a fundraiser, you can use it, there's a lot of energy, money, and blah, blah, blah. 
So I was, took the, I was away with the kids all summer, so the day I came back, he said, oh, there'll be about 30 people here. And I said, oh, no. 300 people showed up. James, I didn't know any of them. I mean, he's just, in, he just did his thing. James stayed for the whole thing, and it's said on TV, so I'm not revealing anything, that he said, and you know, whatever you may think of his politics, the youngest solicitor general, the guy is one smart, Cookie, and he knows how to articulate. So someone has to, you know, I think it's be, someone has to really be, have a full throat clarion call and the articulation. Then you need a, like a Paul Ryan that really has done the policy homework. And we need to talk about these ideas, not how many houses Mitt Romney has, or his dog having diarrhea on the roof, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, my girlfriends and I had this, and we'd watch the debates yeah. together, and every time somebody did something embarrassing, we'd have to take a shot. <laughs> I said, we got to stop this, because we're well, all you, turning into Elkies. To. That's like we're they not. Need to, they need to shut Mike Huckabee up. He's made a fool of himself today. What happened? He said that uh, women needed the Democratic Party because they couldn't control their libido. Boy, that's going to get you. <laughs> it's going to get you a long way. Wait, I don't even get that. Uh, that they need the contraception <laughs> mandate that women. I mean, yeah, I think it. I don't think it's going to go over real well. With you. <laughs> <laughs> just my guess. I, uh, and, and they just like <laughs> need to get a, a unified position. Rape is bad. Contraception is good. And just go with it. Boom. Let me, uh, we'll um, ask Mary uh, one question, then we'll go to uh, audience questions. So if you could be I begin I would just like up. to say for the record, whose libidos are most uncontrollable? I, you said that would be I've a been, male I'm not, thing I'm not, or I'm just thing. saying what Mike ought to be said. That's well, all. That's, I'm not getting into whose libido. See control? I'm not talking about I'm going to show you some control. Saying, <laughs> they need to <laughs> stop <laughs> talking about Talk about it more. Back down, let Huckabee go out and... What? Go at it again. Right, Get Vic Santorum out this there. That's why we don't talk about that. Right. <laughs> Mary, let me ask you. So, uh, if if you of course he might not have actually said that because James just makes up stuff. Okay. Okay. He didn't say it. And he says it with such authority. Right. You're like I, I was. I would sit here in front of 800 people and just make it up. You've done I just it before. was sitting here. I said, you know what? I think I'm going to go. Mike Huckabee, libido. <laughs> That's the way I done. think. Don't. I'm not saying something in the realm of right. that planetary system might have happened, right. but by the time it goes through your filtering okay. system, it's I, not. Again, <laughs> again, I did Todd Aiken didn't say what he said, Richard Murdoch didn't say what he said, Rick Santorum didn't say what he said, none of them ever said anything. Okay. Would you like me to say some of the things you've said to I, me? I, I'm not running for president. <laughs> I'm not running for the Senate. <laughs> Don't vote for me. All right. So if I make were... crude, rude jokes. <laughs> I would not vote for me. <laughs> I didn't just experiment with marijuana. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, I gambled illegally. I hung a little paper in college, uh, you know. This is so crude, but he is so funny. The funniest uh, yeah. thing he's ever said in politics, to my mind, and I can't even say it, because he gets away with crudity. I mean, he said during the primaries, and I'm, he can't retract it because it's out there, if, and I'm quoting him, so don't yell at me. If Hillary gave Obama one of her balls and they'd both have two. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Now, how can you beat that? Did you not say that? Did I make I that said. up? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the... Uh, the LBJ Library has oh, hit a oh, new I'm low. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I meant testicular <laughs> fortitude. I meant to say that I forgot we were in the place of time. I'll say a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> I've got to ask you, Mary, the same question I asked James. If, if you could handpick the GOP candidate, presidential candidate today, if, if you were forced to make a decision as to who the most uh, competitive candidate from, from the Republican side would be, who would you choose? Uh, what, what I started to say about why Republicans don't like Republicans anymore is because they're not proposing what we know works. I would like to see a governor with a record that has worked, that it has deployed and employed these conservative principles, common sense principles. What Mitch Landers, a Democrat, what he's done in New Orleans. My, my favorite is Scott Walker. I was for Mitch Daniels last. I'm very disappointed he didn't run. I liked... 
uh, Eric Perry. I just don't know enough about what he's done in the state, but I like what Scott's done because I think getting our art and surrounding what Chris Christie's done in New Jersey, he's had a little traffic <laughs> issues lately. But, um, you know, that's, that's important, public pension funds, Rob, and I, we were talking about last night, so that, and he can articulate it, and you have to be authentic. And I like governors, I like those skill sets, but I like Paul Ryan, I just like ideas, the ability to articulate them, and to not be baited into, again, talking about Mitt Romney's dog or some such stuff like that. Right. I think we will, and I, I, know the pre I know there's bigger, there's more focus in reporting on the Republican schism, but, the Democratic Party is, they've got some splits there. You watch these, these midterms, they're not, it's not like the, a lot of these senators who are in competitive races are embracing their president mm -hmm. in the way that you would want to. There's, they're not, they, they're, they're gonna have, they, they, they're gonna gotta do what Bill Clinton did in night, whenever he said the era of big government's over. They've gotta move back to the center because we don't have that kind of money. I mean, we just don't, we can't do it anymore. So that's, I think those are both interesting. And I want Hillary to run. I really want Mrs. Clinton to run. I want to tell you what a, a wonderful person she is. She was the first person to call me after Matty was born in the hospital. We're not friends. That was lovely. She, when she was in the Senate, nobody, nobody sees these things. She was one of, Dick Cheney was the president of the Senate, one of our favorite go-to people. She always under-promised and over-delivered. She never said she was gonna do something and didn't do it. And, and she, really, she was a great senator. And I want, having two daughters, for them to see a serious, a serious run. And my second reason I want to run is because I know we can beat her. <laughs> Let's take some questions. We have time for about three questions. Anyone? Sorry about that. I was just quoting him on the testicular thing. <laughs> it's pretty clever, though, isn't it? Questions? I think we've. I have one. Yes, please. So, um,. I lived in New Orleans. My kids were born at Auctioner, lived not far from you all on Jefferson and Camp Street. And um, I can't tell you how much fun it is to hear you two talk about New Orleans. Uh, makes me pretty close to want to, uh, I love my Keep Austin wear, but definitely wouldn't mind moving back to New Orleans. When I lived in New Orleans, which was in the 80s, um, I think the most shocking thing to me, I'm not a New Orleanian, my husband is from South Louisiana, but the most shocking thing to me coming down to New Orleans was to have no better way to put it, race relations. The, the tension between the different groups in New Orleans was upsetting, it was, you know, it was astonishing. Um, who do you credit with kind of helping cut through a lot of that. Do you credit Katrina and the community kind of coming together as a whole? Do you credit Mitch Landrew? Do you, uh, you know, do you credit in some regard a Drew Brees for, you know, coming in and, and playing hero and giving to the schools and, you know, that kind of thing? I mean, yeah. New Orleans like, is All of the above, place. all of the above. And let me say, because I, James warned me coming down there about the, tension in the race relations, and that's why Mitch didn't want to run in the first place. And I didn't see it. I said, I, maybe I'm naive, but I grew up in Chicago. I did not feel it. Everybody who was there wanted to be there. I would add to your list uh, mothers, African-American mothers. So when we, when Mitch went to 67% of the black vote, 67% of the white vote, uptown, downtown, every income thing, people wanted to save New Orleans and I find there's, there's still, there's tension that is so historical and the legacy of it, I don't understand, but the day-to-day -day living, this is a true story. We're having a dinner party one night. I said, what? there's no white people at this party. We gotta diversify. I mean, we're just like, we gotta, it just, I don't, he will have, a, he has a different take on this. I'm just telling you how I feel that everybody who lives in New Orleans now is not looking to, for disunity. They're looking at how do we 
how do we make each other better? How do we all grow together? I'm not yeah, trying to right, be a Pollyanna right, either. Right. I, I, first of all, if you lived there in the 80s, I think your assessment is a lot of truth to it. And you can't, history is history. You really got to, uh, I'll tell you how bad it was. In 1992, the Carnival Crows were all segregated. And Dorothy May Taylor on the city council said, the city is not going to pay for cleanup of exclusionary Carnival Crows. So either, and we're not going to issue a permit. Two Crows, and one still won't. That's it, we're not. Everybody else said, to hell with it. And people were like, oh, can you believe that? It's 1992. 1992. Now, it, yeah, we have made tremendous progress. I tell you what I give credit to, and this is it. Our generation has not been able to infect young people with our prejudices. My children, if I mention someone is Hispanic or African American or gay or anything, it's, what, what, do you, what, what, what difference does it make? Well, why do you even mention that? That's not. In, in, in these young, and in, in so part of what's happening, I give a lot of credit to the mayor. You know, remember, the reason he lost in 2006 to Nagin, after Nagin had a nervous breakdown during mm -hmm. the storm, after Nagin went to Jamaica on a city contractor's dime 90 days after the storm, is because there's certain whites in New Orleans refused to vote for him because his daddy integrated City Hall in like 1970. All right? I mean, that father time has also got something to do with this, you know? But, but you're right, in, in, in the, the, we have had a, no sense in, 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 in Sugar County, we have had issues there that are much, much better. And, uh, you know, I like to point out to people out of Louisiana is that uh, we had the first Vietnamese congressman in history the first Indian governor in history, to, to, until recently, the, the, the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court and our senior senator were both women, and our three largest municipalities are governed by racial minorities within the municipality. We have a black mayor of Shreveport, a black mayor of Baton Rouge, and a white mayor of New Orleans. It's not too bad of a record when you stop and you think about it. But James, and uh, I think, we, go ahead. No, no, I, I should say, uh, so clearly some of this is generational, but uh, one of the, the, the Woman just asked, uh, is part of it was the catalyst, Katrina, in some respects? In words, I, 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 I think, I think in, in some respects, it, I think it was, and I think some of it was, was, was Mitch, was the mayor, because the Landrew name. Yeah. It, 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 to me, and what I always tell people, it doesn't matter if we have a white mayor or a black mayor. The thing that's important is, is the people of the other race have to trust him. All right? And that's, a, that, and that's what really Mitch and the Landrew name bought, that they knew that name and they knew, you know what I mean? And so the really important thing is that you got to have in a, in a, in a city with a, with, with a history like we have, I think that's an important part of it. Right. And it's also part of who we are. It's why, it's why I like it. It's why it's our, well, our music, why we honor our culture. It's such an integral, you know, in, important and central part we wouldn't be New Orleans without a large or, or you know, majority African-American population. We would be something else. I mean, right? We'd be like Omaha or something, okay? It's not, <laughs> it's Peyton Manning would be calling our name out, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, and, and, but your question is a good question, and what I'm really pleased to report to you is, no, no, have we eradicated? No, 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 no. But, but, but mate, I think you'd be quite pleased if you came back. I think things are much better. And it was a very good question that I think had to be had to be asked and had to be brought up and talked about. That's great. Last question. This is a little bit of a smaller question, but uh, David Vitter, the senator from Louisiana, just announced that he was going to run for governor. I'm curious, uh, as you are both Louisiana residents, what you each think about his prospects and what the campaign will be like. Thank you. <laughs> I don't like to play politics in, in my own backyard. I'm playing in Virginia because Eddie, it's old Trent fan. So if friends of mine run, then I'll get involved. I've already publicly supported uh, Jay Darden in the primary. Uh, and what I really care about 
is that the relationship that Governor Jindal and Mitch Landrieu, Baton Rouge and New Orleans have, which had, had traditionally been counterproductive, mm. it's really been synergistic. I hope that whoever wins that continues. Yes. James knows yes. the I, 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 I tell you something uh, uh, about Vitter. I, I, I'm not going to vote for him, but that wouldn't surprise anybody, including Senator Vitter himself. Uh, <laughs> he pretty much knows what I think. Uh, he, he, first of all, he's, he is really real fast smart. He's a Rhodes Scholar, and he works like a rented mule. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I mean, he will, he will get up early. He will campaign hard. And he doesn't, he, he doesn't bother him that he goes in with 48% of the people. He, he's not bothered by the fact that I'm going to never vote for him. He, he's, he's going talking after his vote. Uh, and I like the idea. I get along fine with Governor Jindal. Uh, you know, if, we, if you... You got to deal with the guy. We were channel the Super Bowl. We need state help. We can work with people. We'll do whatever. Uh, I, I, my guess is he's no better than 50 50 to win. Because the way it works is, is everybody goes at one time, then the top two go. Now, he could win any Republican primary with a majority. In most places, the one that just gets the most votes go. And the Republicans have a, not as much as Texas, but a pretty good built in baked in the cake vote in a statewide election. Uh, you know, it's not impossible. The only Democrat that probably could win for governor would be Mitch if he ran. Then he would be, would be no worse Which than he is. Can, can I clarify something? Because I am not, this is my being for Jay Darden does not mean I'm not for Vitter. I like Vitter in the Senate, Senate because when I grew up in the Poppy Bush days, the Louisiana senators had whack. I mean, they really, seniority matters. Mm -hmm. And he does work hard, he and he's a, he's a great senator, and he works well <laughs> with it. He, he works well on things right. that we agree, coastal restoration, energy. He and Mary have co-sponsored a lot I, again, of things I, together. I, 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 I like I, to I, have I agree. seniority. I'm, not, I, I'm just going to demur on the fact that he's a great senator, but it's just my opinion. I'm <laughs> but I, I, I'll say this, he, he is going to be formidable. He'll raise a lot of money. He'll work really hard, and he's he's not he's not he's smart. He's a very stout machine too. Very yeah. stout organization. And I shan't be supporting him, voting for him. <laughs> <laughs> but that wouldn't surprise you at all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The book is Love and War. And James, Mary, we appreciate you giving us a little love and a little war. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a lot. Oh, look at my. Pen.